believe it was a year ago when we were memorizing Hebrews 11. How many still could quote Hebrews 11? Think you could? I know Sharice can because she uh, quoted it on the way up here. One of the things, one of the hardest things about remembering Scripture, I mean, I got to be honest, I only got a few verses. I didn't make it very far, but uh, any long passage of Scripture that I've ever committed to memory, it's gone in a few months, right? So one of the hardest parts about memorizing something is keeping it in there. And so the only way you can do that is every once in a while you got to find opportunity to quote it again. And so make sure you're, you're, uh, you're trying to do that. Go back to these verses that you've memorized. I know some are working on 1 John, and if you haven't already started that, that might that's a good one to uh, pick up and start trying to memorize some scriptures from there. There's, uh, I just want to encourage that. We hide the Word of God in our hearts and in our minds, all right? So <clears throat> this is a good, a great passage of scripture. We'll go back a little bit to Hebrews 11 in a minute, but I want you to turn to Genesis 13 now. Genesis 12, of course, is where we're introduced to Abraham. Guess a little bit in chapter 11, and then in chapter 12, he gets the calling on his life to leave and follow the Lord. In chapter 13, look at verse 10. We see that, you know, he Abraham takes a lot with him, and they go, you know, wandering, just following the Lord, trying to find a place where they're going to dwell. They've got tents, and they're dwelling in tents, and... And then they get to this point where, you know, they're, they're too huge. They're going to have to split up. So Lot's going to go one way. Abraham's going to go another way. And Lot chooses uh, Sodom. We know the story there. And in verse 10, it says, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou come, comest unto Zoar. So, we see that um, that Lot chose what he thought was paradise, and of course it ends up not being paradise. God end up, ends up destroying it by fire uh, in time. But he goes there because uh, the land looks prosperous, looks like a good place to dwell, and we see uh, he ends up actually being in a house with doors and all that. I preached. I don't. I don't think it was here. I think it was in Iola. But a while back, I preached on. Uh, Lot choosing paradise and the idea of, of paradise, you know, and it's how it's not always what you think it is. And so uh, in there, I, I talked about this fact, but Abraham, chooses, he says, you take whichever way you want. Lot chooses to pitch his tent towards Sodom and then eventually moves into Sodom. And then Abraham stays where he is. And the Bible talks about how he continues to dwell in tents. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 again. Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. So the word tabernacles in the Bible or tabernacle is pretty much the same as a tent. It's a temporary dwelling place. And uh, there's a lot of uh, examples in the Bible of people who dwelt in tents or tabernacles. Of course, we think about the tabernacle in the wilderness that was set up to look similar to the ta what would become the temple. And the, you know, the children of Israel carried that and the Levites had their certain job responsibility. When it was time to pack up that tabernacle and take it to the next campsite, uh, they would, you know, they had their orders and they would box it up and they would carry it and they would go to the next place and then they would set it up. That was called a tabernacle because it was temporary. And another word would be uh, tents. But the Bible talks about uh, this concept a lot in the Bible. Look at Genesis 4, verse 20. Genesis 4, verse 20. In verse 20, and Ada bare Jabel, he was the father of such as dwell in tents and of such as have cattle. So there was almost like a, a people group, you know, the nomads that had cattle. And uh, in Africa, it would be the Fulani tribe. The Fulani are these uh, hardcore Muslim uh, nomads who travel around and they take all their cattle and they just graze from one field to the other. In... in uh, 
uh, Israel, obviously there were a lot of sheep herders, you know, they raising sheep and they take them from pasture to pasture, setting up tents along as they go. And, uh, there's a lot of talk about that. Chapter nine, you're in Genesis. Look at chapter nine, verse 27. Oh, too far. Verse 27 says, God shall enlarge Japheth and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant. So, I mean, just the idea of dwelling in tents is something that comes up a lot in the Bible. So, so why are you talking about this? Well, the title of the message is Dwelling in Tents. All right. Obviously, we're going camping. And so <laughs> I got tents on the mind, right? Uh, no, actually, uh, we just we were just talking about this. Uh, we just had a conversation about this idea of, uh, of dwelling in tents. I'm trying to think of when that when that was, we had some kind of conversation about that. I can't remember. And I was saying, I was telling Brother Justin, I said, I'm preaching on this actually on Sunday. So uh, the idea here, dwelling in tents, I'm going to get into the application here in a minute. We can all ap apply this to ourselves. I don't think anybody in here lives in a tent. I could be wrong. Maybe somebody does or at times have in your life, you know, and that would be fine. But, um, but I don't think that's the case. In the Bible, it was very common. Uh, the, I already mentioned the tabernacle in the wilderness, but then there was also a feast, okay? The idea was when they got into the promised land and they set up, they had their houses, they had all that stuff, God wanted them to remember their wanderings in the wilderness. And so God actually set up a feast that they would follow where they actually had to, for seven days, dwell in tents. Every year, camping trip, seven-day seven camping trip, living in the tents to remember the wandering in the, in the wilderness. Look at Leviticus 23. I'll show you. And the, we'll make some application here for the message, but I just want to build this up with a little inter introduction here. Leviticus 23, verse 39. Also, in the fifth day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days." And he shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. He shall celebrate it in the seventh month. He shall dwell in booths. All right. That's another word for tabernacle. This is also called the Feast of the Tabernacles in the Bible. Uh, feast of the Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And it says you shall dwell in booths seven days. Uh, all that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. And here's why. Here's why. He says this is the reason for this feast that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And Moses declared unto the children of Israel the feasts of the Lord. Now, the original intent was for them to go straight into the promised land. I mean, it was a pretty quick journey, like 11 days or something, I think it was. A pretty quick journey from, you know, after they crossed the Red Sea and then they went to go into the promised land. But what happened is, you remember the story, they didn't have faith. And so when they got to the promised land, they looked in and God had said, hey, you're gonna, I'm going to give you that land. You're going to go in. I'm going to fight the battle for you, basically, and you're, gonna, you're going to prosper. But they went into the land to spy it out and they saw these people and they saw the, uh, you know, giants in the land is what they said. And we're like grasshoppers in their sight. No, they, 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 just, they just lost the faith to do it. And they said, no, we can't do that. And they couldn't be convinced by Caleb or Joshua or Moses. They couldn't be convinced. There's no way if we go in there, we're going to die. They lost faith. So God said, that's it. I'm going to make you wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And for 40 years, you're not going to have a permanent location. You're just going to be wandering around. Which is, what, which is what he's wanting them to remember with this Feast of the Booths, okay? And it's going to bring some humility and it's going to bring a remembrance uh, that their trust is in the Lord and not in their own uh, hands, own riches. All right, now today, not very many people dwell in tents, okay? Uh, like I said, it, it, you know, there may be some. I think we drove past the 
uh, underneath a bridge the other day and there was a tent set up in the bridge. Some people live in tents, I understand that. You go to uh, San Francisco, there's going to be a lot of tents out there. Probably the government gave it to them and the drugs that they could use and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and they could dwell in tents. All right. Uh, but most of us, we can't relate to that. So by application, here's what I want you to think instead, because this is the principle. Dwelling in tents, uh, when I say dwelling in tent, tents, think of it like this. Just, just something that's not permanent, something that's not a possession uh, of long -term, uh, longevity. Okay? So here are some examples. Some people I know live in travel trailers. You remember when we had Brother Chris Miller come down? Now, he had a, he had a really nice <laughs> he had a really nice travel trailer. That wouldn't have really been that hard to live in. Uh, but I know missionaries whose family live in travel trailers and they're missionaries or, or evangelists. They go out preaching the word and, and uh, full-time ministry, but they live in a basically a camper. Now, when we first moved to Iola, actually, we, we, didn't, we, we were renting a house as it was. We were in Bible college in, in uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, you know, but you always have this idea. You're raising a family... You know, you want, to, you want your family to be happy. You want your wife to be happy. You want to purchase some land. You want to have land that's yours and a house that belongs to you. And you don't have to pack up and move again or whatever. But we didn't know what the future held. And when we had decided the Lord was uh, moving us to Iola, uh, the only thing we had guaranteed as a place to live was a place right where we are right now. But it wasn't the, the uh, manufactured home that we live in now. It was something probably half that size, maybe even smaller. And it was a really old trailer that people had lived in for, for years. You know, several people had lived in it before us. And, and it was going to be very rough to raise three kids at the time. And uh, it was going to be very small. I didn't know what kind of a salary I was going to have, if any. So I figured that's it. We're going to move there. I don't know how long we're going to be there, but we're going to be stuck in this little trailer for that whole time. And we went ahead and did it by, you know, by faith. Hey, everything's going to be okay. And actually, as it turned out, Iola, uh, the people of Iola, Iola decided to buy a new building and it was nice and it was accommodating and it ended up being a great, uh, a great thing. But in my mind, I had to say, you know, I'm willing to live in something not such good conditions, right? In order to, to serve the Lord. <clears throat> um, when, for a while, we thought we were going to Texas, and we would have had to leave that place that we are now, go to Texas, and the place that we were going to move into was a trailer that looks a lot like ours, only half the size, <laughs> right? And my children at this point were grown, and we would have been sleeping on top of each other. I mean, not, tech, not literally, but, you know, it would have been a really small, confined space. Again, didn't know really what my salary was going to be, if any, and uh, just trusting that the Lord was going to take care of us no matter what. For some people, choosing to simply rent instead of buying a building is kind of this idea of, man, I hate renting. I don't really want to do that. And, you know, uh, I remember when we started this church and we were at Matt Ross Community Center, it was kind of a nice deal because we, I mean, it was a nice place to meet and, and uh, we enjoyed it. It did, it did us well, but we were like, man, it sure would be nice to have a building where the stuff could just stay permanently. We don't have to be like the children of Israel and pack it up every time we have a meeting and then move. And then, uh, uh, and then so now we're in this building, which obviously we don't own. We're still renting it. And obviously we could outgrow it. You know, Lord willing, we will. And, uh, and I haven't talked to too many people about this, but quite honestly, there's a slight possibility that this property could be sold and the whole, the whole property, the church and everything be sold. And we would have to be, have to move. You say, Oh no, aren't you worried about that? Not at all. <laughs> because I know God, uh, knows what he's doing and he could move us, you know, uh, somewhere. I don't know. He could move us into the heart of uh, KC and uh, ghetto, <laughs> but give us a building, a storefront, who knows what the Lord could do, right? So we just want to search His will. But the application I want to make is that we have got to be willing in order to serve the Lord to be to do with less and to do with something that maybe wouldn't be what we feel to be our ideal situation. And, uh, and I'm going to explain to you points of application, okay? So number one is this. 
a lesson we can learn from this idea of dwelling in tents and the children of Israel dwelling in tents, Abraham dwelling in tents is this. Don't put too much stock in the things of this world. That's a simple application. Don't put too much stock in the things of this world. Now, it's very easy to fall into this. And I don't care who you are, how, you know, how little you have or how much you have. It's really easy to start thinking, hey, this is the world I live in. This is the job I got to wake up to every day. This is the house. You know, this is a, a whatever. And, and you start forgetting the most important things and start thinking about this is what I need. And if we're not careful, we can fall into that. And really, it just becomes this bottomless pit. You know what I mean? Where we're just all of our time and our effort and our thinking and, and everything just gets wrapped into that. And, uh, and it's like, I've always thought about this. Like if I, I've never owned a house, I've always rented. Okay. But, uh, I would love to own a property, but if I owned a property, you know what happened? The roof would start leaking. I had to spend thousands of dollars to get a new roof. The air conditioned unit would go out. I have to spend thousands of dollars for a new air conditioned unit. Cause like all of a sudden everything is your responsibility. You can't just call on the landlord, uh, to fix it up, you know? And so at some point then you're just constantly just throwing money into this and throwing money into that. And it just becomes your whole life just keeping up with these things. When quite honestly, as Christians, there are more important things to do. Okay. Now I'm going to put this disclaimer out here because I hope you don't misunderstand me. It's not wrong to own a home. You know, I've, uh, as, people have asked me for counsel. Hey, sh we have this opportunity. We got the money. We got a down, you know, down payment and everything. And we could own this home. Uh, I would always suggest you just be careful and don't get in uh, over your head, but I would never say that's that not a good idea. It could be a very good idea to own your property. Uh, I know churches that have the idea that say, hey, we're never going to buy a building. We're just going to rent or whatever. Well, I'm going to tell you this. We have a building in Iola, and that's a huge blessing to have a building. It's paid for. It's got all the facilities that you need. Uh, that's, uh, that's a blessing, okay? It could be a good thing. It's property. You know, worst come to worst, you could always sell that property, and, uh, and uh, then you could rent if you had to or whatever. But owning property is not a bad thing, especially in this day and age. I'm not saying that that's bad. Also, I'm not saying it's not it's, that it's wrong to have a good paying job and to be su successful in that way, you know, have plenty of income. Uh, there, are, uh, there are a lot of pros to having that. All right, so that's not my point at all. In fact, uh, men, you have, especially if you have a family, wife, and you have children, you've got to make sure you keep up with their needs, you take care of them. Uh, husbands, it's biblical and it's right to keep your wife uh, happy. But the main point is you really want to just make sure that serving God is your priority. You know, even though you're doing all those other things to the best of your ability, you're serving God and, and, and that is your priority. And you would be willing to be content with much less. You would be willing to walk away from what you have right now that you love, that's been a blessing that you feel like has fulfilled your dreams. Maybe even you'd be willing to just walk away from it and uh, and give up, give up all. I was thinking about my mom and Tim and they uh, in uh uh, Kalamazoo had a nice property and I remember going down, they, they refinished the basement and it was really nice. Everything was great. And I thought it was really cool, uh, that they were willing to just walk away from that. Like it was nothing. And I almost felt like sick to my stomach for them. Like, Oh man, you put so much into that, that house and everything. But you know what? They were miles and miles away from the kids and they said hey we want to go be closer to the kids want to be part of this uh this work you know my son's a pastor and and i want to be a part of that i want to be supportive of him and all that and they're just willing just like that to walk away from all that we as christians should be willing to just walk away from something and say well how can i better serve the lord you know uh there are uh there are times in our lives where we're going to have to give stuff up and make that decision but here's the thing when you're a believer and you love the Lord and you want to follow the Lord, you're not attached to anything in this world. You know how to be content when you have, you know how to be content when you don't have, and you just walk away and say, God's first. I'm just going to follow him and uh, put it all into his hands. That's where we need to live as Christians dwelling in tents. Okay. Now the reality of the matter is there are a lot of things that are far better than any riches, any kind of any kind of wealth like that, buildings and, and such. There are things that are far better. First of all, look at Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22, 
this isn't a super spiritual uh, application, but just simply having a good name is rather to be chosen, the Bible says, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, a loving favor rather than silver and gold. What does that mean to have a good name? I think Rocky is a pretty good name. <laughs> actually, some of you some of you have already heard this before, but uh, but the name Ricky is actually a good name. I never cared for it when I was a kid. I mean, nothing personal against my dad. I'm a junior, and I don't have that's not a bad name. It's just I liked Rocky a whole lot better. But <laughs> Ricky was a pretty good name, right? Ricky meant wise ruler. And I was like, you know, that's that. Once I found out what that means, that's real good. But I was given another name, Rocky, which sounds cool. But you know what Rocky means? Full of rocks, <laughs> a big, dumb, inanimate object. <laughs> right? That's not a good name, right? <laughs> but the name Rocky is just a name. The the name, you know, we talk about the name Jesus. You know, there's uh, no other name among heaven whereby uh, we must be saved. It's talking about the name of Jesus, but it doesn't mean the name Jesus or Spanish Jesus or in Hebrew Joshua. You know, it, it, it's talking about what that name stands for, the person, who he is, right? And so it doesn't matter what my name is, Rocky or Ricky or, or Randy. Some people call me Randy because <laughs> Randall, I guess. Who cares what that is? Who am I? What do I stand for? Is, do I have a good name? Can people trust me? Do people, uh, uh, you know, think of my character as something trustworthy and something that's good and right? A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. But, you know, there are people out, of the, uh, out in the world, a lot of big name people you can think about right now, you know, they got a, they got a terrible name but great riches. And they could care less if their name is, is mud. They're, you know, they're just like, who cares? I got all the riches. Say whatever you want about me. Call me bad names if you want. No, 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 no. Just from a humanist standpoint, right, even not even thinking about eternal life, just on this earth, I don't want to go, and everywhere I go, people are thinking, oh, what a wicked guy, or, you know, how uh, corrupt this person is, or whatever. I want to have a good name, and a good name is rather being chosen than great riches. What about relationships? All right, let's uh, say you're a billionaire, and you own all this great property or whatever, but you have no good relationship, right? And there are a lot of people out there, divorce after divorce, you know, Bill Gates is the latest, uh, you know, uh, t in the tabloids, you know, his big divorce. And what are they doing with their billions and billions of dollars and, and uh, how are they splitting it up and all that? You know, what's the point of having all that if there's nobody you love to share it with? <laughs> you know, what, what would be the point? You know, so it's far better to have that relationship and to have loved ones in your life than to have all those things. How about your health? What good is it going to have to have all the riches of this world and then be sick and die or be sick and be miserable for the rest of your life, po uh, poor quality of life and, and all that because of your health? These are important things. To have a purpose in life. How, you know, it's important to have a purpose in life. Can you imagine roaming around your life? Well, people do it all the time. Not knowing what is my purpose in life. I used to work with those guys, right? When I was in Bible college, uh, I would work with those guys. And you know what their purpose in life was? Here was the best purpose they could find in their life. I just can't wait till Friday so I can go to the bar and get drunk. That's it. That's their life. All week long, they're working so that they have money so that they can go to the bar and they can spend it just like that. And they can wake up and say, Where, what happened yesterday? I don't even remember. <laughs> That's their whole purpose in life. That's sad. That's sad. I would give up uh, all the money in the world to not have that, you know, to actually know that I've got a purpose in life. These are some, uh, uh, some things we've got to remember. Now, compare the life of Abraham in the life of Lot. Now, Abraham actually did have great riches, right? He actually did have a lot of cattle. He had servants. He had all those things. But he still wandered in tents. He still, uh, you know, was waiting for the promises of God, serving God, and he did. He wasn't worried about uh, getting the best plots of land or whatever. That was what Lot was worried about. He looked off and he saw the fields and he said, "Oh man, my my, you know, animals will really prosper. You know, hey, there's a nice town. I could set up. You know, I could I could buy a nice place to live out there, raise my family, and all this." But then you follow his life. And he had no effect, as uh, as Brother uh, Thompson um, 
I don't know why I never call him Josh. And Brother Josh preached on Thursday night and preached a great message on that. And, uh, and, he, was, and he said, uh, I never really thought of it this way, but when Abraham was uh, pleading with God, saying, you know, would you spare Sodom and Gomorrah if you found 30 righteous? And God said, yeah, I'll spare it. How about 20? And he talks them all the way down to 10. And he's like, yeah, if there were 10 righteous, I would spare it. And Abraham begins to realize there's not very many righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Which means that Lot and his family had zero impact <laughs> on the community. They weren't reaching the community. They weren't, you know, nothing was, was in fact, the opposite was happening. Their family was being influenced because whenever the angels come to pull them out of Sodom and Gomorrah, even the, his daughter's uh, sons-in-laws, I mean, his sons-in-laws, his daughter's husbands, right, are just like laughing at him and they're not believing what he's, what he's saying about the angels coming to him and all that. And they get out. Even his own wife looks back and becomes a pillar of salt, you know, that whole, uh, that whole story. And so this gives us the idea and this understanding that Lot went after what he thought was paradise. He went after what he thought was the substantial success, wealth, and riches, and it ended up all getting burned up. And he had to have, have to, angels literally had to pull him out, pull him away from that, that city because he was taking too long to get out of there. And, uh, and pr probably... The only reason he was spared is because of Abraham. <laughs> Otherwise, he would have just died there with the rest of the uh, with the city. Um, but anyway, uh, Abraham, however, said, hey, what you know, if you want to go that way, you go that way. and I'll go the other way. You choose. And so he picked uh, he picked uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham was just content with whatever he had dwelled in tents, found pasture. Uh, and he uh, he endured. Number two, the not only. You know, do we just not want to put stock in the things of this world? Closely related to that is this, the idea of dwelling in tents and, and the idea of what God was showing the people by the Feast of the Tabernacle, I mean, uh, yeah, Tabernacles, is that no matter your income, no matter what you have, what, you pos what your possessions are, whatever, no matter, you need to stay humble. You need to stay humble. And the Bible calls that uh, being poor in spirit is something that Jesus talks about. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We need to realize that everything is God's, right? And no matter what you have, he could take it away from you in a moment. I often am uh, guilty. I've probably shared this before, but I often feel guilty when I realize how good my family eats. You guys eat with us on Thursdays. You know that we eat pretty good, right? Because we, I'm not lying. We don't put on a show. We eat like that every day, <laughs> okay? My wife and my daughter, good cooks. Case in point, <laughs> right? I try to run. I try to exercise, but I just can't burn off those calories because there's some good calories, right? And I've often thought, like, what would happen if we just went into a famine? It wouldn't be all that unexpected, really. As Christians, we should know better. Whatever well, our, our society just shuts down, the economy just, you know, just goes to pot. I think we're going to be there probably in the next few years. <laughs> what happens if all of a sudden we've got nothing, right? And we're doing the beans and rice, Dave Ramsey uh, plan, <laughs> if you know who I'm talking about. If you don't, don't worry. <laughs> but uh, we're eating beans and rice, rice and beans, you know, and we're just trying. And I've often thought, like, could my family handle that we've been so spoiled you know we've been so spoiled just eat good all the time <clears throat> well i don't really want to be put to the test but to quite honestly yes i believe what we can and we have there have been times in our life where we had nothing and we were sitting around not too long ago as a family and we were talking about that you know and i said hey guys we need to like keep ourselves in check and just realize like you know, I'm not always going to be able to eat like this. Anything can happen, right? And then we started reminiscing about times in our life, Oklahoma City or Springfield, where we had nothing. I mean, no, I mean, like waiting for, you know, you get your paycheck on Friday. You guys know, some of you know exactly what this is like. Get your paycheck on Friday, you know, you go pay all your bills, and then now you're like, uh, I got to wait till next Friday or maybe two Fridays or whatever. What are we going to eat? And I've never been one that was on like uh, welfare or anything like that. So I'm not even, I don't even know that that routine. <laughs> okay. I'm just like, hey, we, uh, we need to wait for until our next paycheck. I'm out trying to find odd jobs or whatever so that we can have a little extra money. But you know what? We were reminiscing and we were thinking about some of the meals that we ate during that time. And some of our favorite meals came from that time. 
where my wife would just kind of throw a couple things together and add a little something, you know, and try to make it good. And, and my kids were like, you know what? We never even really thought about the fact that we were poor. And that meant so much to me because you know what I, I realized is that you can enjoy things in your life when you have them. And God gives them to you and you're like, hey, what a blessing. And I'm not saying that we should waste, but at the same time, it's just like, hey, enjoy it while you got it, <laughs> right? And then still love the Lord and still be happy and still love your family and still be just content as can be the next day when you got nothing. And I'm telling you, that is not something that you can, you'd want to trade for all the riches in this world. You want to have contentment, right? That's godliness. We need to be... Uh, we need to be willing to part with, uh, with these things. Um, I've even uh, been thinking about Viviana lately because she, she hasn't known the hard times yet. <laughs> and I'm just going to tell you, in the last few weeks, I noticed she's getting spoiled. Now, who would have thought this little girl would be spoiled? <laughs> but we're getting to that point where it's like, no, you can cry, but you can't throw a fit. This is not acceptable, right? Because she's throwing the little fits like she's the princess. What do you expect? She's like new pair of clothes every day, new new headdress. Who's ever seen her with the same headdress on twice? <laughs> She's got a new bow or something like that. Little spoiled brat. If we're not careful, we're gonna raise a spoiled brat. Okay, so I get worried about that, but I'm like, what I need, what we need to do is teach her that whether you have it or you don't have it, you're still gonna love the Lord. You're still gonna love your family and be content with the things that you have. All right, let's move on to the last point. Dwelling in tents. Okay. Now, the idea, like I pointed out earlier, dwelling in tents had to do with something that was temporary because you know you're going to have to pack up and you're going to have to move, you know, later on. <clears throat> and really, in a, in a sense, those applications I made as far as living in a trailer, living in a, you know, renting a house, living in an apartment or whatever, you know those are temporary. I mean, you might live there for a few years, but that mindset that, hey, it's just temporary, I could leave. And again, as a Christian, you need to have that mindset that even if I purchase this property and I own it and it's paid for and everything's wonderful, it's still God's. And I could still, I could still walk away from it in a moment's notice, right? And as long as you're poor in spirit like that and you think in, that, in those terms, right, then by my definition of application, you're still dwelling in tents. Does that make sense? Okay. So the last point about the tents is this. As Christians, we need to be on the move. Okay. We need to be on the move. You know, there's this idea that people have that, you know, just taking up space is like doing something for the Lord. You know what I mean? <clears throat> I've shared this before where when we used to uh, pick up bus kids in, in uh, Oklahoma City, we worked on the bus route. They had a huge children's ministry. And something that we hear a lot, if we were, you know, a kid was misbehaving and we were trying to uh, discipline them, I mean, we didn't physically discipline them, but, you know, we tried to, you know, uh, stop them from doing whatever. And sometimes they'd get mad at us and they'd be like, well, I'm not coming to this church anymore. And I remember just laughing to myself, thinking like, why do you think that that is such a, I mean, we do want them to come, all right? Because we want to impart some spiritual things to them. But why do you think that that's going to hurt us that bad? I'm not coming to this church anymore. Oh, no, what would we do? <laughs> Who's going to pay the bills? <laughs> Who's going to, you know what I mean? Because these kids weren't doing anything. In fact, they were breaking stuff. They're using, you know, everybody costs. We're paying for, you know, we're feeding them and we're doing all this stuff. If you think about it, everybody costs something. You know, everybody is, is using some utilities or something of somebody. So, and I'm not trying to get on anybody that's not, you know, the, you're not pulling your weight around here or something like that. I'm just saying that the idea that, hey, just sitting there, you know, taking up space is some blessing to God. It's not. The Christian life, in the Christian life, if you're standing still, that's negative. All right. I heard this recently in a message and he's talking about the word uh, occupy in Luke 19. He's, the parable of the 10 talents. He says uh, the, 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 the master of the house says, occupy till I come. All right. And he's going away. And in the meantime, you know, these guys are supposed to be doing stuff and making investments with his money so that he can when he comes back, he's going to have more money than he did whenever he left. All right. And the one guy, you know, he folds his talent in a napkin and he buries it and he's like, he doesn't want it to be, you know, messed with. And when his master gets back, he's like, look, I have what you gave me. I didn't lose it. 
I took care of it. Here it is. Well, that's not occupying, okay? That's not really occupying. That was just sitting there doing nothing, right? And here's the thing. I, I got to thinking about this when I was listening to that message. So the guy that was doing nothing was a servant, right? Which means he's probably getting paid. If he's not getting paid, he's at least allowed to live there, and he's allowed to eat there and everything. So he's actually costing his master money just by showing up to work or whatever. He's actually costing his master money. And so when he comes back and he's like, here, I gave back what you gave me. No, that's not enough. You're supposed to be making me money. See what I mean? Now, if this was a business and it's not, this is a church. And so it's all God's, you know, it's all between you and God. And, and I just tried the best I can to oversee it and all that. But in a business world, you know, if you're not making the employ, employer money, Right. You're going to have some words and there's going to they're going to figure out, you know, now, obviously, we're, we could care less about money. What we do as a church is we're trying to reach people for the Lord. We're trying to encourage one another. We're trying to lift each other up. We're trying to, uh, uh, you know, change lives out there and help people out. And and there's so many things that we're supposed to do that are spiritual things. All right. We're not really concerned about money. But um, but but that's the idea is that if we just sit around doing nothing it's not just like, hey, we're not doing, we're not doing anything for the Lord. No, you're actually a ne you're doing something negative, negative. and it, I can tell you this for a fact. In Iola, there was a time where we had a larger crowd of people, and I'm not picking on anybody in particular, and don't try to ask me who these people are or whatever. But we had a, a larger group of people, but I'm telling you that the spirit of the church was bad, and people would come in and they would just feel like ice cold. You know, there would be times where they would come in and uh, uh, we'd have a guest preacher and he'd preach his heart out. And afterwards, he'd be like, did I say something wrong to offend people? Because I'm looking at the faces and everybody's just kind of like. And I said, no, brother, that's just how they are every single service. <laughs> OK, now, look, I'm not tearing anybody down, I'm not trying to. <clears throat> but those people, I don't care if you fill the whole church with those people, they weren't doing anything for the Lord. OK. Fast forward a few years later, a lot of those people had left. Different circumstances. I'm hoping that, and I believe some of them at least, went to a church. They got plugged in, changed their attitude a little bit, and I'm hoping that they're doing something more than they were doing uh, at, at, during that time when they weren't doing anything at our church. Okay. And here's the interesting thing. All right. Again, it's not about money. Uh, I hate to even bring it up, but I found something very interesting. When all those people, I mean, like half of the church left, you know, and then whenever it comes time to count the uh, tithes and offerings, no change. What's that tell you? <laughs> right? They weren't really they weren't really vested in the church. Their heart wasn't in support of the church. They didn't care about the church. And I'm telling you, the church. <clears throat> in fact, it was a negative on the church. And when they left, and the people that were supportive of the church were pulled together loving each other, supporting their pastor and everything, then get the preacher to come in and say, no, for such a small group of people, these people really love the Lord and these people are fellowshipping and these people want to serve the Lord. They want to see people saved and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, that is what we're supposed to be doing to contribute to the Lord's work. Amen. We got to have the idea like Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 6, 8. Let's look at it real quickly. Isaiah 6, 8. <laughs> and Isaiah sees this vision uh, of the Lord, and he sees the seraphim saying, Holy, holy, holy of the Lord of hosts. And uh, verse 8, God says, uh, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell this people, hear indeed, but understand not and see indeed, but perceive not. Isaiah's heart was, you know, he saw the Lord, he saw the work of the Lord, and he said, hey, if there's anything I could do, here's a guy that's like, I have unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people who only He didn't necessarily think that he was like God's gift to the world. But he's like, hey, if you need to send somebody, send me, I'll do it. That's the attitude that we have to have, you know, Almost everything, I'm, I, I, I mean this, this isn't false humili humility at all, okay? Almost everything in life that I've done where I had like a promotion or, or whatever, it wasn't because I was really good at what I was doing. 
<laughs> all right? I'm not kidding. I, I, remember, uh, I remember working in retail, all right? My math skills, not good, not good. My customer service, okay, I was pretty decent with customer service, but uh, only because I could handle the yelling and all that kind of stuff better than some people could. Uh, but my math skills were terrible. Drawer comes up short all the time. How many people working? <laughs> That's not a good thing, all right? You're costing the company money. But I remember having my boss say, like, man, we would take you over almost any of these other people because you're going to show up. You're not going to complain. You're going to do all these kinds of things. And it's like, I don't even want to be a cashier. Please take me off the register. But they're like, no, we need you. Here, come. You can train people. You can do this. I'm like, no. <laughs> UPS, same thing. I could, I could load boxes. Give me a box, you know, it's kind of playing a game of Tetris. I could put it where it needs to go and I could do that and I could sweat all night and I could work. And, uh, and then they're like, hey, we need some people to step up into management. And I'm like, I don't know if I can do that. I mean, I put me in a truck, I got load boxes. I don't know if I can lead this whole belt to, to do that. No, we need somebody. Why? Why do they pick me? Because you show up every day. You don't complain. You do the work. You do what you're told to do. Not because you're really good at it, right? I go to, uh, I go to Heartland. And, you know, I didn't want to work with the bus ministry. I didn't even, I didn't even want to work with children, actually. And that's what I ended up doing for years and years and years, working with children. But I didn't want to. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to take care of kids. I was, I was just barely raising three kids myself and trying to figure out how to raise them. <clears throat> and all of a sudden they said, well, we need some people to work in the bus ministry. All right, I'll go help out a little bit, knock on doors, give invites, you know, pick kids up, whatever. And before long, it's like, oh, by the way, we need you to get your CDL and learn how to drive a bus tomorrow so that you can be the bus captain by Vacation Bible School. And I'm like, what? I don't want to do that. And you know what's funny? I, I don't know if I've shared this before or not, but I became the bus driver. I didn't even want to, but I did it. Okay, if that's what needs to be done, I'll do it. I won't complain. I'll, I'll do it. I was terrible at it. I didn't know how to lead people and pick up kids. Have you ever seen me? <laughs> can you imagine? It took me like two hours to get every kid home. <laughs> I get lost and everything. If you know me, you know why he's laughing so hard because I got a terrible sense of direction, but they needed somebody to do it. And there was a guy who had been driving the bus for the previous captain for, for like a year. And this guy was kind of mad. And I didn't know that at first, right? We started having meetings. I'm like, oh, I guess we ought to have a meeting. Let's have a meeting and we'll talk about what we're going to do. And I noticed this guy, it just seemed like something was wrong. He was not happy. And for, you know, the next couple of weeks, like it always seemed like everything I said, he's like arguing with me and, and doing it. Come to find out, he felt like he should have been the captain because he had been there for so long and everything. And I'm, when I found that out, I was like, man, I would love for you to be the captain because <laughs> I don't want to be the captain. But there must be a reason that they put me here and not you. And I got a feeling it has something to do with that attitude of yours. <laughs> because you would much rather have somebody with a good attitude who's willing to serve. Lord, here am I, send, send me, than have this guy. I don't care how talented he is, but he's going to give you just a thorn, be a thorn in the side and be a grief. And, uh, and we, don't, we need to have the attitude that says, here am I, send me. What can I do for you, Lord? I'm not perfect. I got unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, but I'll help you uh, with, do whatever you want me to do. Uh, let me skip ahead and just close with this. Let's turn to Matthew 24. <clears throat> and we'll just close with this idea. So you're trying to serve the Lord. You're wanting to, you know, you're wanting to do great things for God, but at the same time, you get distracted. You got property, you got land, you got this nice job, you got, you know, who, whatever it is that you have, right? Security, you know, insurance, 401k. I don't know. I'm trying to throw all these things out there. I've only had one of those once. <laughs> that didn't last very long. So you got all that. And then the tribulation comes. <laughs> now what are you going to do, right? Here's what Matthew 24 says, verse, starting verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of war and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. 
Hey, you know what I believe is the thing that's ruining our economy? Well, there's a lot of things probably. They're ruining our economy so bad right now. A lot of that has to do with the shutdown from COVID and the result of the, this pestilence, right? <laughs> pestilence are coming. But I don't believe that this is the pestilence talking about here. I think it's going to be a lot worse, all right? We may have just saw just a bare, uh, you know, just a glimpse into what it's going to be like one day when we're dealing with pestilences and famines and earthquakes in diverse places, all these things. But it says, they, and it says, verse 9, they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of an, uh, all nations for my name's sake. This is uh, the whole world, you know, following the Antichrist. And uh, if you compare this to uh, other passages in Revelation and Thessalonians, uh, this is uh, the whole world is following the Antichrist and they're being deceived by the Antichrist. And they're calling good evil and evil good. You see that in our world today? And so now all of a sudden they're just coming down on Christians and they're turning them into, and they're, then they're putting them in prison and killing some of them. And, and this has always been, you know, we've, we've lived for the last, you know, century or so in a pretty easy, you know, world. So, you know, I know we had world war and stuff like that, but really throughout history, Christians have always been persecuted and, and all that. Those real Christians that are living for the Lord and you shall be offended I'm mean, sorry. And, and uh, then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because of iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You're going to have to endure this coming tribulation. You're going to have to endure that, you know, until you get to the end of it, then you'll be saved out of it is what he's talking about here. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for, uh, for a witness unto the, all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Who readeth the, uh, who so readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the rooftop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with a child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the world, I mean beginning of the world to this time, no, uh, no nor ever shall be. Imagine getting to this point where it's like, you know what, don't even go back to your house to grab your belongings. You know, he's kind of describing how bad it's going to get right before the end. And it's just like, you know, hey, they're coming for you. If it's uh, if you've got a child and you're fleeing with your child, that's going to be real difficult. If you're traveling on the, the Sabbath day, you kind of have to know the understand the, the culture in that day. But the things that went on in the Sabbath day, it's going to be harder to travel on the Sabbath day. And he says, look, there's going to be great tribulation like there's never been before. And I wonder who are the ones that are going to be betraying people and who are going to be the ones that are turning people over and all that. It's probably going to be those people that are like, you know what? I really like my house. I really like my job. I really like all that. I don't want to lose all that. And so they would betray everybody else because they're so concerned about their belongings, right? And so we know that that's going to happen. But we need to be willing to say, you know what? Everything that I have right now, I could just lose it all tomorrow, not be able to get it back, have to dwell in tents and uh, <laughs> caves and, and what have you, and flee out into the wilderness and just wait for the Lord to come. But guess what? The Lord will come. Amen. And He will take us out of here, and He will give us and reward us according to uh, the, what we've invested in the treasures that we've laid up in heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank You for your word. And I pray that you help each of us be content in whatever state that, you, that we're in and whatever you've blessed us with or whatever you take away from us, Lord, help us continue to serve you and uh, continue to be uh, strong in faith and uh, living for you. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless this church as we seek to serve you and uh, be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray.